the COVID-19 pandemic has inflicted unprecedented stress on the healthcare system and caregivers. During this time, many elective surgery have been canceled and non-urgent surgery has been postponed. In this challenging time, many surgeons, including, including you, are deployed or willing to come out, to work outside their comfort zone to help fight the virus to save more patients' lives. In this short presentation, I will provide some basic information about the virus and the information about the aerosols and what are the aerosol generating procedures so that we can protect ourselves because we are important. If we are sick, we will not be able to take care of the patient. So the virus is a RNA virus ranges from 0.06 to 0.14 microns. It can be found in nasal pharynx, in upper and lower respiratory tract, and in GI tract from mouth to rectum. It can be found as well in blood, bile, and feces, but it's negative uh, in urine and CSF. As the coronavirus disease pandemic accelerates, global healthcare system have become overwhelmed with potentially infected patients seeking testing and care. It impacts all specialties in medicine. Uh, preventing spread of the infection to and from the healthcare worker and patient all relies on control and prevention. The CDC comes out with this hierarchy uh, of controls, including elimination of the source, substitution, engineering control by putting the patient in the isolated room with negative pressure, administrative control, and PPE. Uh, look at here. PPE is the least effective way of controlling the infection. So what is aerosols? Simply define aerosols are tiny particles or droplets suspended in air. Aerosols is the abbreviation of aero and solution. It is a suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets in air or, or, or another gas. Are aerosols dangerous? Yes. You can see from here, uh, if the patient cough out with a lot of aerosol, which can travel long distance, if you inhale this aer uh, virus containing aerosol, you will also get infected. Uh, this is a study published recently in Nature Medicine by researchers from Hong Kong. They, um, they looked at about one, uh, or more than 100 um, patients who were infected with the uh, of uh, 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 respiratory um, virus. And um, <clears throat> the finding were significant and interesting. They found that in patients who were not wearing the face mask, 30% of them had the virus present in exhaled drop this, and 40% drop this was present in the exhaled aerosols. However, in patients who were, who were face mask, no virus was detected in the exhalation. So this study is important in uh, reinforce the concept, concept of wearing a mask for the uh, healthcare, prof, uh, uh, healthcare workers.
Okay. The um, surgical mask is different from our N95 respirators. Um, surgical mask is a loose feeding disposable devices that creates a only a physical barrier uh, between the mouth, nose, and the potential contaminants in the immediate environment. It only, it only blocks large particle droplets, splashes, sprays, and splatters that contain maybe um, um, the um, path pathogens, including virus and bacteria. So on the other hand, a N95 respirator can filter out 90% of the particles that is greater than 0 0.3 microns. Don't be confused though. I mentioned that the coronavirus is about 0 0.1 microns. So it seems that a N95 a respirator will not be able to filter out the coronavirus. This is not true because the coronavirus, when it comes out, is in aerosol form. The aerosol form diameter is greater than 0.3 microns. Because of shortage of the um, N95, so the CDC have a statement saying that you need to wear an N95 respirator for procedures. However, if the N95 respirator is not available, you need to you can use a face mask. I'm not sure if this is right or not. If you are performing a aerosolizing procedure, you really need to wear a N95 respirator. If you want to know the standard downing and doffing procedures, go to the CDC website. There's a good video there. So what are the aerosol generating procedures? These procedures include incubation and extubation, back masking, uh, bronchoscopy, and insertion of chest tube. Any procedures involve any procedures involving electrocautery or blood uh, or gastrointestinal tissue or any bo uh, body fluid or aerosol generating procedures. So laparoscopy, of course, is aerosol generating procedures. So is endoscopy. So when you get a call from uh, a uh, your uh, medical ICU intensivist requesting a tracheotomy for a COVID-19 patient who has been incubated for 10 days, would you do it? Um, the short answer is no. Um, study from a colleague from China has shown that most of those who become critically ill with COVID-19 do so because of rapid progression of pneumonia to ARDS uh, and death. The bottom line, the need for mechanical ventilation was associated with about 50% of mortality. The um, benefit of performing early tracheostomy in uh, critically ill COVID-19 patients are not clear from the currently available data. There is no identified time point when this patient either improved, remained stable, or progressed to death due to the pulmonary complications. But in the uh, SARS-1 ep epidemic, the mean time from onset to death was 23 0.7 days, suggesting low potential benefit of tracheostomy prior to this time. People may say that, you know, why do we need to wait for two to three weeks?
because by that time, the virus has been cleared by the body uh, from the blood. But this is, as a matter of fact, there's no anticipated timing for virus clearance, especially in critically ill patients. They may have significantly longer positive testing and the virus may be remain in the blood for more than three weeks. So the recommendation from the American Academy of Orthorarynology uh, is that you need to avoid tracheostomy if the patient is resp uh, um, is uh, unstable in terms of um, resp uh, respiratory. You should consider, you should not consider tracheostomy before two to three weeks of intubation, after the intubation. You need to, of course, exercise strict donning and doffing procedures. The location of surgery is important. Ideally, you should do it on bedside in ICU with negative pressure. And you need to limit a number of providers in the OR during the procedure and after the procedure. You need to paralyze the, paralyze the patient in order to avoid the patient fighting and cause some more uh, contamination. Avoid using heart instruments. Uh, when you make a tracheostomy incision, you need to advance the ET tube below this uh, opening. And you need to avoid a tracheosuction directly. Uh, of course, you use cough and non fungi straightening tracheostomy tube. Avoid circuit disconnection. Even if you need to suction the patient, suction the patient with closed circuit. Uh, when you have the tracheostomy tube in place and you need to need to connect the endotracheal tube with a ventilator filter so that the virus will not come out and contaminate the room. And uh, after the surgery, you need to delay uh, the tracheostomy, tracheostomy tube change. Uh, you can wait until the, if the patient's negative. Okay, now when you are on call for emergency surgery and you need to see your patient with uncomplicated appendicitis, um, what do you do? Um, there's some evidence suggesting that a patient with uncomplicated appendicitis can be managed with IV antibody followed by PO antibiotic, but this is um, the data from uh, uh, Europe. Um, with this approach, the failure rate is quite high, anywhere from 30 to 50%. But the bottom line is that you can try a course of antibiotics, and um, you, may, you can buy time. If the patient will be is good for two or three weeks a month, or a month, that's great. And then later on, you can bring the patient back uh, for the surgery. If the patient comes in with a complicated appendicitis, meaning the patient had perforation or abscess formation, um, you can ask the um, interventional radiologist for uh, the abscess formation for the joint. However, if the patient had perforation and the patient is uh, present with a peritonitis, well, you have no choice. You need to do the surgery. For the um, biliary colic with pain, you can manage the pain, you can delay the surgery. However, if the patient presents with crescendal symptom of refractory pain, well, <coughs> laparoscopic cholecystectomy should be performed. If the patient coming with a common bile duct stone, don't fail to spontaneous past. Uh, ESCP with sphincterotomy will be needed. However, keep in mind, uh, 
the uh, ERCP is aerosolizing procedures. Um, before this crisis, when the patient coming for the carbon dioxide stone and after the GI uh, call it clear the carbon dioxide, we would pro uh, perform uh, the cholecystectomy during the same hospitalization. However, during this crisis, we should delay um, this elective cholecystectomy. For patients coming with acute cholecystitis, if patient has a good operative risk, you should operate on the patient. However, if the patient has underlying medical condition, the patient is sick, the patient is on dialysis, um, obese, you may need to um, try with antibiotic. If fail antibiotic management, you may be able to call your IR physician for a percutaneous cholecystectomy too. However, if you really need to do it, you need to do cholecystectomy. Um, the mortality rate, uh, the, morbid, uh, the morbidity rate is quite high during this time. So, open procedure versus laparoscopy procedure, um, which one is better? Thus far, there's no solid data. There's a little evidence supporting one from another. But in general speaking, um, laparoscopic procedure is um, minimally invasive, of course, and will reduce the length of stay and will potentially decrease comp the complication. But um, <coughs> laparoscopy is an aerosolizing procedure. So um, keep this one in mind. If you need to perform laparoscopy, make sure you have uh, the trocar incision as small as possible to avoid leakage. And you need to use minimal CO2 insufflation pressure. And you need to use ultra uh, uh, filtration. And the pneumoperitoneum should be evacuated with the filtration before the trocar removal, uh, removal and before the specimen extraction. Or in, and if we need to convert the laparoscopic procedure to, the, uh, procedure to open, you should evacuate the pneumoperitoneum with filtration first. Um, during procedures, uh, laparoscopic or open, you need to avoid using hot instrument, including bovi, uh, harmonic scalpel or uh, <coughs> or legal sure. Bec um, if you really need to use uh, bovi, that use uh, needle tips with smoke evacuation. Although the previous research has shown that laparoscopy can lead to a uh, aerosolization of blood-borne viruses, there's no evidence to indicate that this effect is seen with COVID-19. Um, however, we should exercise our precaution and we should treat it as um, aerosolizing procedure when we um, using the uh, laparoscopic instrument. So um, the bottom line, you need to protect yourself. You are most important. And there's no substitute for sound surgical judgment. Uh, the bottom line is try to do no harm. Good luck.